Proverbs, Proverbs. We're going to go to Proverbs 27, 23. Proverbs 27, 23. Turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 27, 23. Before we get started, let's give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. Proverbs 27 and 23. Proverbs 27 and 23. If you guys say amen. amen. If you ain't guys say hold up. Proverbs 27 and 23. Tonight we're talking about my business. My business. My business. How many of you know you need to be taking care of your business a little bit better? Amen. Amen. Raise your hand. Amen. So tonight we're talking about my business. Not your business. My business. Proverbs 27 and 23. It says, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. A uh, living Bible translation says this. It says, uh, riches can disappear fast and the king's crown should not stay forever. So watch out for your own business closely. Uh, one of the things is the devil get us caught up. Uh, you guys have a uh, Wi-Fi and so now you got Netflix and you got Instagram and you got all these various different things and the interesting thing you can catch yourself on Instagram or what's that thing TikTok for hours hours on TikTok you can be for hours on Instagram and while you wasting the time you ain't handling your business you, you, you misappropriate the time that God is giving you God says, be sure to take care of your business. Because the thing is, you ask God for great things. But if you're asking God for great things, you have responsibility in that thing also. See, the thing is, we like to blame God. Well, well God, I didn't get the house I wanted. God, I didn't get the job I wanted. God, God I don't have my degrees. God, God, I don't have the car. God, I don't have this. And God's looking at you. What did you do? Take care of your business. Uh, be aware of your situation that you're in. God says, take care of your business. Next, turn to me to 1 Thessalonians 4 and 11. That's in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 11. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 11. This was good right here. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 11. It says this. And that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business. And to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And as you study to be quiet. And the, the Living Bible translation. And to mind your own business. One of the greatest things that you can do. If you want to be successful is mind your own business. See the thing is. When you get other people's business. Now you get other people's problems. Now you get other people's situations. And the Bible says sometimes, matter of fact, most of the time, it will benefit you to mind your own business. How many of you ever got caught up in somebody else's mess? Uh, one of my friends, her daughter got caught up because her girlfriend said, my, my man cheating on me. And they ran over there and bust the man's windows out, scratched up his car. Now you got a whole situation that you done brought up to yourself. That ain't have nothing to do with you. The Bible says, mind your own business. you got enough of your own business. Why are you worried about what somebody else is into? If it don't affect you, sometimes you got to mind your own business. That don't mean you can't be concerned for somebody. Somebody call you and they say, well, I need help or, well, I need this and that. You can listen. You can participate in building them up. But if they doing something they ain't got no business doing, you don't have no business helping them. Mind your own business. Some of you, you're young, and the thing is, uh, the devil will come at you with situations. Sometimes it's just best if you mind your own business. It was a man, he, uh, they interviewed him the other day. And I saw it in the LA Times. He lived, he's 108 years old. And they asked him, they said, what's your secret? The first thing he said, I mind my own business. And I thought that was profound. But then I thought about it. The thing is, if you mind your own business, that's less stress on you. You can get yourself caught up in a whole bunch of mess when you're trying to take care of other people's things and neglecting your own. 
Mind your own business. Next, turn with me to 2 Chronicles 20 and 20. 2 Chronicles 20 and 20. 2 Chronicles, thank you, Jesus. 20 and 20. I done got in a whole bunch of trouble. Mind getting in somebody else's business and not taking care of my own affairs. 2 Chronicles 20 and 20. This is called my business. 2 Chronicles 20 and 20. And it says, And they rose up early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of the land of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe in his pastors, and listen to what they say, so shall ye prosper. So number one, uh, if you believe in God, he will establish you. He will give you a foundation. The, the problem that so many of us have, we're standing on shaky ground. Your mother and father didn't give you a solid foundation. Your grandmama and your grandpapa didn't give you a solid foundation. So you're struggling right now because you're standing on shaky ground. The Bible says, God says, if you believe in me, I will give you a solid foundation. Some of you need to truly stand on your faith and believe in God. Because everything that you see around you has failed you. Your friends failed you. Family failed you. Schools failed you. So God says, if you want to change that, believe in me. And then it says, listen to the pastors and ye shall prosper. What does that mean? You might not need to follow my lifestyle. I, I can do some weird things. But listen to the words that I say. Because the words that I say are the only things that in this Bible. Listen to the words of the pastor and ye shall prosper. That means you will have prosperity along your way. Because I'm only saying the words that are in God's book. Listen to these words and ye shall prosper. Believe in God and he will give you a solid foundation. You want your family to stand on solid ground. You want your finances to be on solid ground. You want your relationships to be on solid ground. You want your thoughts and your dreams to be established on things that are solid. Trust in God and he shall establish your ways. Next turn to me to Proverbs 18.22. This is for the men. It's going to get hard tonight for men. This is for the men. Proverbs 18.22. Proverbs 18.22. It says, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth the favor of the Lord. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth the favor of the Lord. Uh, number one, uh, men, God says, if you want his favor, you need to find a wife. Uh, it, uh, uh, the thing is, being single as a man is cool because you can date this woman and date this woman and date this woman. Uh, if you've ever dated, this is for the fellas, we ain't talking about the women. Every time you go out and date men, most of the times you pay. So you got three women, you pay it three times. If you got three women, it's Valentine's Day. That's three Valentine's. If you got three women, you got three birthdays. If you got three women, you got three Christmases. God says, the man who will find it, the wife, find it a good thing. God said, get you one and hold on to that one. Because if you get two, three, four, five, that's more stress on you. God says, if you want favor, find a wife and you obtain the favor of the Lord. Next, go with me to Ephesians 5 and 33. Ephesians 5 and 33. Why are we talking about this? We're going to get to it. Ephesians 5 and 33. Men, this is for you. Men, this is for you. Women, you got a part of this too. Men, this is for you. It says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as you love yourself. Stop. Men, you need to love that woman the way that you love yourself. And, and that's hard. And see, some of the things you ladies are going to find, some of the men that you date don't even like themselves, much less love themselves. Look at their lifestyles and the things that they do. So men, God says, love that woman like you love yourself. That means don't do nothing to her that you wouldn't want done to yourself. That means we have to treat her fairly, treat her the way that we want to be treated. 
God says, love that woman as you love yourself. Let's keep reading Ephesians 5 and 33. And then it says, women, ladies, women, it says, respect your husband. Respect your husband. Respect your husband. Now, here's the thing. When a woman falls in love, as any pimp can attest to, there's nothing she won't do for that man. She'll rob banks for that man. She, she, she'll do all kinds of crazy stuff for that man. When a man loves a woman, there's nothing that she won't do. But here's the problem. All men are flawed. And eventually, that man will disappoint that woman. He will do something and let her down. He will do something that she didn't think he would do. And it destroys the faith that she had in him. And here's the thing about that. When a woman sees the faults in a man, it does something to her heart. And the first thing she does, she starts to disrespect him with the only thing that she got, her mouth. She starts to tear him down with her mouth because she sees something in that man that cut her and hurt her. So God says, he says right here, he says, women, respect that man. Have reverence for that man. Respect that man regardless of how he disappoints you. And that's not easy to do because the first thing you want to do is cut and tear because you're hurt. But God says, even when you hurt, you got to respect that man. Why is this important? Most of the problems that we have is because of what our mothers and fathers didn't do. Most of the problems that you have, it started with mama and daddy. If mama and daddy wasn't together and they didn't do what they supposed to do together, now you coming through with the, all the shortfalls, all the financial stress that you got, all, all the things that you didn't have because they wasn't together. See, a mom and a father is sort of like a house. And you're the children that live in the house. They protect the children. But if mama and daddy got faults and cracks, that means like, like when it was raining the other day, now you're going to get wet with their mess and with their situations. It, it's so interesting. I see young people, and, and you know my job is to talk to young people. One other day, I asked a young lady, I said, how many brothers and sisters she got? She said, I got 10. I said, oh, 10, I said, okay. I said, she said, my mama got four, my daddy got four, and then I got a step and step. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, pray to Lord. How many live in the house? She said, just two. I said, oh, okay. These families now are so confused because you got children here, children there, children everywhere. You got all kind of craziness and chaos going on in these families. And this mother don't like this child because this child belonged to that mother. Because mom and daddy didn't take care of their business. So men and women, you have to lo man love and treat that woman how you want to be treated. And woman respect that man even when he disappoints you and he lets you down. Next, turn me to Ecclesiastes. Ephes go to Ephesians. Ephesians 6 and 4. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians 6 and 4. Ephesians 6 and 4. Ephesians 6 and 4. Men, it's going to be hard for us today. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And ye fathers, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurturing admonition of the Lord. Let me translate that. Fathers, don't disappoint your children. Dad, don't disappoint your children. Father, don't let your children down. Father, see the thing is, 90% uh, of successful people always give their credit to their father. It's interesting, when you watch the NBA, you watch the NFL, you see, hi, mom. They only say hi, mom, but they ain't no dad. But when there's a father that's there, when there's a father that's being, doing what God has called him to do, when they look at that father, they see God. So men, don't disappoint that child. Don't, don't, don't let that child have to cry at night because you're not there. Don't let that child have to cry at night because you touched them. Don't let that child have to cry at night because you're not providing for them financially. Fathers, don't disappoint your children. Why is this so powerful? 
I grew up in a home without a father. I didn't meet my dad until I was 38 years old. As a teenager, I, I acted tough, but I was hurt on the inside. And because I was hurt, I hurt the young ladies that I dated. Hurt people hurt other people. So daddy, if they call you daddy, you got to be there for them. Uh, but that woman, she won't let me be there. I got baby mama. I know what that feel like. I was dragged in and out of court. I went to court so many times it didn't make sense. But I went. And I dealt with it. And I, I dealt with it. I remember one time they took child support out of my check. I got a check for $22. I said, what? $22? Because they took all my money. It went to child support. Now, I... I, I, I I would just say, God, what would do with this? And God says, I got you. Why would God say that? Turn to 1 Timothy 5 and 8. Turn to 1 Timothy 5 and 8. Thank you, Jesus. How could God get me and, and I only got a check for $22? Turn to 1 Timothy 5 and 8. And God say amen. 1 Timothy 5 and 8. It says, but if any man provide not for his own, and specifically for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and he is worse than an infidel. But if any provide not for his own, and specifically for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and he is worse than an infidel. So the thing is, God says, if it's yours, you got to take care of it. That's a hard word. Because we live in a world where it says it's about me. And here's the thing. If you don't take care of that child, man, we ain't talking about the women. See, this is for men. Why would God put this on the man? Because it all belongs to the man. That's your child. That's your woman. That's your responsibility. When that woman dies, God ain't going to talk to her about them kids. What? When that woman dies, she ain't going to be talk. God ain't going to say nothing to that woman about none of them kids. He going right to the daddy. What? Those are your kids. But the court said they ain't got nothing to do with God. God said, you made it. I gave them to you. What did you do with them? Why do you say that? Because God calls you the head. You're the head of those chil children. You're the head of that family. So God says... If you don't do what you're supposed to do with them, you're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. And everything that you touch will be cursed until you provide for those children. I don't know one, no one man who neglected his children who's successful. And I know thousands of men. I'm a kappa. I, know a whole, I got a whole lot of fraternity brothers that are rich. But the only ones who made it were the ones who took care of their children. So men have to take care of their families. And it's not easy because we live in a world where we're the enemy. Because Satan hates us because of who we are. But God says, be there. Provide for your children. Next, turn me, turn me to the book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs 27 and 20. Proverbs 27 and 20. Proverbs 27 and 20. Proverbs 27 and 20. Proverbs 27 and 20 says this. Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of a man are never satisfied. Hell and destruction are never full. So are the eyes of a man never satisfied. What does that mean? Heaven is not going to be crowded. Heaven is not going to be crowded. And the number one reason why heaven ain't going to be crowded is because most people can't forgive. It, it, it ain't got nothing about you to, uh, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and taking communion every first Sunday. Ain't got nothing to do with it. Most people ain't going to heaven because most people can't forgive. That's the greatest sin amongst many men. They're holding on to pain. They're holding on to tragedy. They're holding on to disappointment. And they can't forgive their brother. They can't forgive their mother. They can't forgive their friend. They can't forgive their father. They can't forgive. God says in Matthew 6, 13 and 14. He said, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. So it says here in the book of Proverbs. It says, hell 
will never be full. God is making room. There's another book in the book of Isaiah where God said he's making room. He's making hell real big. Because there's going to be a whole lot of people going there. And the main reason is holding on to past pain. So the thing is, it says here, hell won't be full. Then it says, men will never be satisfied. It, it, it's interesting. I used to fuss. If you had ever had my class, if I saw you with a pair of Jordans, I'd start talking mess. Because Jordans cost 200. How you got them shoes on? And this and that. How many pairs of Jordans are there? I don't even know. I know they released the same shoe in a different color, and y'all lined up outside the door, spent two hundred fifty dollars, stand up all night, and you got plugs, you got all this kind of things in box to buy these shoes, and they cost all this money. Why do you have the same shoes in twenty different colors? Why do you have the same things in uh, so many different Louis Vuitton purses? Why do you have so many different cars? Why do you have all these different things? Because the Bible says the eyes of a man is never satisfied. We're not satisfied. So we always want more and more and more. Y'all young, but I know grown people who got closets full of junk. Got so much stuff in their closet, don't even wear it anymore. But we always want more and more and more. And the more we get, the more we want. God says your eyes cannot be satisfied if you, if you trust in the devil and don't trust in God. Matter of fact, turn to the book of uh, Philippians 4 and 11. Philippians 4 and 11. We're almost done. This is a hard word tonight. Yeah. Philippians 4 and 11. Thank you, Jesus. Philippians 4 and 11. Philippians 4 and 11. Philippians 4 and 11. This is Paul speaking, and he said this. He says, not that I speak in the respect of want, but I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Then verse 12 says, I know both how to be a base and I know how to be a bound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed to be full and to be hungry, but to be abound and to suffer need. And verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Now, here's the thing. The first thing he said is, in whatever state I am, I have learned to be content. You have to learn to be content. What does content mean? I have a lot of money. I'm good. I'm broke. I'm good. Uh, I have a car. I'm good. I'm taking the bus. I'm good. I have a nice house. I'm good. Uh, I'm sharing a room with my sister. Or I'm sharing a couch. I'm good. Whatever state you're in, you have to learn how to be content. Why would God say that? Because if you can learn to be satisfied, God can give you more. But if you complain about everything that you have, why would God bless you? Because everything that you get, it'll never be enough. You'll never have enough purses. You'll never have enough jewelry. You'll never have enough of anything. And the devil keeps tricking you, and then he got you focused on getting things, and now you forgot about God. One of the craziest things that I've seen, our church has been alive for about eight years now. And I, I remember when we first started the church, me and Bishop, Bishop was driving without a driver's license. We would drive around and pick up folks. And when we picked up folks, they come to church. But as soon as God bless them with a car, don't see them no more. As soon as God give them a good job, don't see them no more. Because now they got some things and now I got a little money. So now, oh, I'm tired. I got to go to sleep. Oh, I got to do this. And now you start putting the job before God. And the Bible says, can a man serve God and man? And matter of fact, turn to Matthew 6 and 24. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 6 and 24. Matthew 6 and 24. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 6 and 24. It says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And then it says, ye cannot serve God and money. So it's either one or the other. Which one is going to be your God? Is God going to be your God, or is money going to be your God? And here's the thing. If money becomes your God, it will draw you away from Christ. Next thing you know, you've been out of church six months, 
Six months turned to six years. Six years turned to a decade. Next thing you know, only time you see church is every time you, sl you scroll by on your Instagram. Oh, they having church. Mm. That's like you drive by. Is it Sunday? Some people don't even know when Sunday is. They think, oh, Sunday, brunch. Sunday, fun. Sunday, turn up. Let's go get some wine. And the next thing you know, cancer come out of nowhere. Next thing you know, the devil snatch a child. Next thing you know, all kind of craziness happen. Next thing you know, car accident. Next thing you know, lose your job. Next thing you know, stroke. Next thing you know, heart attack. Because the enemy says, ooh, you ain't got no God. Here I come. What? You, that ain't the truth? Good. Turn to the book of Job. I don't believe this. This man is insane. I'm glad you said that. Turn to the book of Job. When you get God out the equation, Satan step in. Job 1 and 7. Job 1 and 7. Job 1 and 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered to the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down it. Satan is walking all around you. When I was growing up, they always said, Satan is in hell. No, he ain't. Satan's in hell. He ain't even touched hell. Satan is all around you. Satan is sitting in the pews next to you. Satan is at your job. Satan is waiting at the liquor store across the street from you. Satan is waiting in your pocket on that cell phone, that text message. Satan is all around you. For the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities. The enemy is all around you. And he's waiting to destroy you. He's waiting to tempt you. He's waiting to test you. And he's looking to see who truly believes in God. See, the thing is, Satan is the God of this world. He is almost as powerful as Jesus Christ. So the thing is, he has the power of immutability. That means he could see through generations. He saw you. He saw your grandfather. He saw your great-great-grandfather. He saw your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. And he sees all the same traits in you. And he's going to test you and tempt you and try to destroy you with the same thing that he got your daddy with. He's going to come with you at the same thing that he got your mama with. He's here and he's here to tempt and destroy you. But Jesus says, I came that you might have life. And I came that you might have it more abundantly. So if God says, either you team Jesus or you team money. Which team will you join? Which team will be there when you need them? Who will be there for you when you're going through your darkest moments? I remember some of my darkest moments. And I can remember this. God always made a way for me to get out. Some of you have the same testimony. You saw that death was looking you right in the eye. You saw that you were about to die. And all of a sudden, here comes God. A hand come out of nowhere, pull you out. Will you trust God? Or will you trust the money? Will you trust God? Or will you trust social media? Will you trust God? Or will you trust Joe Biden? Who is it that you're going to trust? Because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters, what did you do for God? Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. All right, give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Ephesians 6 and 12. We wrestle not against blood, flesh and blood, but against spirits, powers, and principalities. Your hardest struggles will be spiritual. It's spiritual warfare. And spirit is this. Spirit is something you can't see a spirit. It, you can feel it though. And the thing is, the devil's gonna push against you. He's gonna push against you in that spirit. Uh, anger is a spirit. Alcohol is a spirit. Pill, my, me and my nephew have been talking about the pill ministry. Uh, it's something called Molly. And thank you, nephew, for educating me. Do you know what Molly is? What is it? Uh, what is it, Doc? It's crystal meth. 
So when you popping Molly, you at the party, turn it up. You a meth head. You on meth. Molly is meth. These spirits, see the devil, uh, my, Molly Percocet. What we doing all this, Percocet. Molly Percocet. And we mask off. Not realizing the mask off, the spirit is coming in and transitioning you. The devil is all around you. And his job is to tempt you and to destroy you. So you have to be careful because Satan is all around you. Uh, they lied and said, Satan is in hell. And they jump up and down. They ran around the church. Satan is not in hell. He right in here with us. He right out there. Some of y'all sleeping next to the devil. Some of y'all sitting next to the devil. Some of y'all got hot Cheetos and you eat the devil. The devil's all around you. That's why we want God to cover us, to protect us, to speak a word into us, so that and to order our steps. I am not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but God will often hit me upside the head. I just turn walking, not realizing that he got me walking all around the devil. Because the devil is setting traps to destroy you. Do you know by fasting some of you save your own lives? Because you stop in doing something that would have destroyed you. You'd be surprised how God can save you with the little things that you do. By coming to church, some of you are saving your lives. By reading your Bible, you don't know what God is doing for you in the spirit realm. Because what God does is, when you do right, he'll go in the spirit realm and he'll knock a demon out your way. Because the devil is setting traps. And what he do is, he know, he said, your grandfather went this way. Your mama went this way. I know you coming. And what God will do is, in the spirit, you don't even realize this. He said, oh, she read her Bible. And he just snatched that demon right out the way. You walk right by. Didn't even realize that they would set you up to destroy you. That's why it's so important that you read your Bibles every day. That you come to church when you can. And if you want money, tithe. That is the simplest principle in the Bible. European Jews, Warner Brothers, all these great movies, theaters that you watch, Instagram, Netflix, they own all of them. And the reason why they own so much, they tithe. They're the biggest tithers on the planet. Bill Gates gave away more money than most people will make in 25 lifetimes. Because they understand if you give, God gives back. We learn it's mine. And you take your little $8, $18 out and you stick it in your pockets. And you go to your car, you see a ticket for $75. And then you get in your car, try to go get gas, it's $100. And then you get home and get a gas bill for $400. And then everything, you know, you know, I ain't got enough money. Because you think it's yours. God says you got to learn how to give. Why would God say that? Because he gave you life. He gave you protection. He gave you health and strength. He gave you a mother and a father, whether they were good or bad. He gave to you. So the thing is, he said he wants you to understand the principle of giving. So if money is your struggle, learn how to give. And uh, some of you need a job. I if you did it, I if, you, if it don't work, I give you $100 cash. Say, God... I'm going to tie. You're going to get right to the job. Bing, 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 bing. What? And you call me, you're hired. You're going to be like, what? Because God said, oh, you know what to do now. That's how you keep your money going. Learn how to get. And the very last thing, the enemy wants to destroy you. Money is not your friend. Money is a tool. Uh, my son right now is taking macroeconomics. I'm an econ major. I got a college degree from Irvine about money. One thing that they told us about money, I didn't know this. They said money's a tool. See, when I grew up, we just would grab a whole bunch and grab it. And they said the reason why black people are poor, you don't know how to use money. And see, people who have money use it to make more money because they realize it's a tool. It's not something you get and you can grab a whole bunch of it and stash it away. You're supposed to do something. So God says, you might not know about money, but you know about me. Put your trust in me and God will establish you. I, I grew up with a faulty foundation. I came from a broken family. But when I got God, 
He gave me a foundation. And now my, my family can stand on my back because I got some ground to stand on. And it's not anything that I did. I just submitted to God and he made me solid. Uh, today, uh, right before church, I was sleeping. My nephew was out too. And the thing is, God got me up at 7.15, put all this whole sermon together in 28 minutes. That is crazy. That ain't me. God says, I will give you a foundation. I'll make you solid. Because I need people to stand on your back. The reason why this church is so important is because you guys are young. You're going to be alive for another 60 years. You got, uh, Jay, you got great, great grandchildren that going to call you Big Mama. And they Big Mama, Big Mama came to school day and she, she sang for us and Big Mama. And you, you, got, you got sons that you ain't seen yet. And the thing is, God is trying to, he's going to build on you because you're young and you're strong. So keep sowing, keep working, keep believing. And the thing is, God loves you, and so do I. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Anybody have any words when we close the wrap up? Amen. All right, Dad. So uh, everybody at the church, I had mentioned to a couple people, we're going to be starting doing uh, choir rehearsal, like actually doing the band. So we'll have our own band. We won't be doing music anymore. So if you know anybody that plays any instruments or music or if you or yourself want to be a part of it, um, I'm going to try and hold something maybe 10, 15 minutes after church if possible. And we can all just talk about it. I have a couple of songs that I think we should be able to do. And I'll get you guys' names and numbers and we'll really communicate with that. I'll do a group text and we can go from there. Amen. Give my hands up. All right. That's building foundation. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. His name is literally his name is Sir. Amen. Thank you, sir. Or anybody else? All right, everybody grab a hand. Grab a hand. Grab a hand. Right, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words that went forth. Father, that you continue to strengthen us, Father. Help us, Father, to establish our faith in you. Help us, Father, to believe in the words that are in the Bible. Help us, Father, to live a better life. Father, protect us from the enemy, Father. We know that he is near. He is not far. Protect our minds, protect our hearts, protect our families. Cover us, Father. Teach us how to use the money that you've blessed us with. Cover our families, Father. Protect them from the enemy. Father, help us in those times of need, Father, when, when we don't even believe in ourselves. Father, comfort our minds. Give us peace. Squeeze the hand next to you. I squeeze life into that hand. I squeeze prosperity into that hand. I squeeze vision and purpose into that hand. So these young people become the head and not the tail. So they become victorious and never defeated. So that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. And we ask all that in 